Bruce Panel 3B, Grid Forming Technology Developments that uh, Jason McDowell from GE, who is on, I was going to say on consignment, but it's on secondment to uh, <laughs> the ESIG for a year, will be chairing. Uh, GE <clears throat> ESIG has, has uh, been very fortunate to have the services of Jason for the last year. He's been very helpful with our reliability working group activities and also with the Grid Forming Implementation Council of the GPST. So with that introduction, let me go ahead and turn it over to Jason. Many thanks, Charlie, and welcome. Thank you all for joining. Um, this is the first of the uh, parallel panels and parallel sessions that we have. And uh, I think, you know, as Charlie mentioned yesterday, there's just so much interest and so many topics that we have to cover. It's becoming harder and harder to squeeze it into just one session. So we're going to continue on the on the stability track and technology track uh, in this session, uh, based on what we heard yesterday, and that we kicked off with uh, some of the grid forming subjects uh, that we heard from the keynote and also the panel that Julia led. And this panel is gonna be more focused on grid forming technology development and deployment. And it's very much aligned with all of the activities that we have ongoing right now with our reliability working group. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the session uh, as we get into the Q&A, but we're gonna have four excellent panelists here talking about kind of the state of the state of, of grid forming technology. Um, where is it in terms of its development? What's needed in terms of deployment? Uh, and then um, we'll have about 18 to 20 minutes each uh, to hear from each one of the panelists and then open it up for Q&A at the end. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist and uh, really want to welcome Prashant Kansel from uh, from Tesla. And this is uh, Prashant's first eSig meeting. So welcome. Thank you for joining. And really looking forward to hearing from Prashant on best applications of grid forming technology. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Prashant. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, everyone, for, for joining the session. And uh, thank you, Julia, and for having me over. Uh, and uh, so I think I'll, I'll just get into the presentation. And uh, I was thinking about Dr. Devan's question that he posed yesterday, and I have answers to each of those in this presentation. So we'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, like just the overview, we'll talk about the applications, we'll talk about some controls and, um, and why models are important to prove the controls. And first principles, why do you need grid forming and uh, some of the challenges. Um, so, I mean, just to introduce uh, uh, myself and my team. So I lead the global power systems team at Tesla, uh, which means uh, we develop all the models uh, for power system studies uh, in different platforms, uh, PSCAD, PSSC, Power Factory, and so on and so forth, and do the studies for grid interconnection, uh, both from the grid perspective and balance of plant perspective. We also uh, basically participate in standards and development uh, and also um, uh, basically helping with the interconnection application registration process. Um, so, so we are working with a lot of grid operators throughout the world um, and kind of want to share the experience there. So on, on the modeling side, as you know, like um, a lot of these technologies have to be proven ahead of the time through models. Uh, and this is like one example of you plug in uh, the model in the big, bigger grid system and kind of prove, you know, how it's helping the grid and that's how you do the planning process. So this just one example of that. And we have done that for many, many grid conditions throughout the world. Um, so on the, on the application side, I think probably this is a textbook slide um, on, on, a, on a battery application, uh, like battery has been applied. Uh, and when I say literally it has been applied, like since my time at Tesla, like I've seen it being applied on the C and I, uh, any use case you can say. Um, and then on the transmission side, uh, like all the application, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through one example each for the application, uh, how it has been actually applied in the project uh, on, the, on, the, on the transmission side, be it, be it standalone, utility, uh, a standalone battery or a renewable project or microgrid. So it has, it has been applied in many, many applications throughout the world already. And then we'll talk about specifically utility applications now. So I think the, the first one is energy markets. Um, anywhere there is a market, there has been a need of uh, like either the frequency market or energy market uh, of participation and BES has been like, that's how the BES really started. Uh, it, uh, like for Tesla is a big project in South Australia. 
uh, it's called a Honsdale project, and we participated in the market, and actually we became one of the biggest participants in the market when we applied this battery. Um, and then like uh, in, in Texas now, there are many, many battery projects uh, which, which came from the market application side of the battery. Then as the market really evolved, um, and, and you can think like Honsdale happened in 2017, and then you're now in 2024, and in Australia, like in the, those seven years, uh, all the applications have moved uh, from the market to into the more grid farming side of things. So when you applied the first battery, it was grid following mode, meaning you were just trying to provide P and Q responses against uh, as you're commanded. But then in Australia now, every single project that we are doing is grid farming. And, and the reason that change happened, and this is also an interesting anecdote of how we can bring about change, is in 2020-21 uh, timeframe, we are proposing to like expand the, the Honsdale battery. And at the same time, Australian government came up with this thing called ARENA Research Grant. And they were looking for batteries to convert from following to forming more to prove that the technology works. And then at the time, the thought process for us was, uh, since it's complicated for the first time, everything is complicated for the first time, um, and we have to prove it to AMO that the technology will work. So what we did is we did that studies in-house at Tesla um, and basically uh, went through the full interconnection process and a lot of lab testing, a lot of site testing, and kind of took us one and a half year to convert uh, the 150 megawatt project from following mode to the forming mode. And that, in our mind, really triggered a lot of the adoption of the uh, grid forming mode in Australia, which there were obviously parallel discussion happening about um, having some kind of a system strength market, which is now truly there in Australia. Uh, but then that transformation, like that some something is proven, like really triggered the change. And now, now in Australia, how the market is motivated is through system strength charges, meaning if an inverter would say that I need a certain SCR value to be stable for all the test cases that they want you to be stable. So the test cases come from, uh, from, the, from the grid interconnection rules. And then against those test rules, you have to prove that you will be stable. Then if you, if you have to like take that system strength from the grid, then you have to pay a charge for it. And there is some nodal pricing for it. Uh, and then it's kind of basically um, to avoid that charge, you are doing grid forming because grid forming uh, by principle doesn't need any grid. It can be stable by itself. Um, and that's kind of making your SCR value to be zero so as to so, and that's why we pay zero system strength charge. Um, so th that's a motivation in Australia right now. Obviously, there are talks about uh, how you, how because if the utility is selling you the grid strength, they must be getting it from somewhere. So the people who are actually bringing the system strength into the grid should be paid too. So that's another side of the market that's been under discussion. Um, <clears throat> But then I think like just fundamentally what is grid forming? And I'll, I'll have a like more detailed slide just to show you through some examples. So at the time, like when we were doing Honsdale project, uh, what we did is we had like, I think 160-ish inverter on the site. And then we basically uh, showed, we converted two inverter to grid forming uh, and le left the rest in grid following just to compare the exact response for a grid event. Uh, to prove, prove the technology. And then you can uh, see there's a PFR response, which means and it, it, it's directly proportional to what the frequency is. And there is an inertial response, uh, which is again captured from the site as uh, if the frequency is fast moving, like it's acting against the rope off. Um, and, then, um, and then in the, in the full grid study case, there, there we also looked at the oscillations on an interconnector, uh, which connects South Australia to Victoria and looked at how the damping is looking on that line. So those are the kind of the frequency benefits that we try to directly capture. And then on the on the voltage side, um, the 101 of grid forming is basically it's providing you the instantaneous response uh, so that uh, grid never goes dark. So as to say, so you're, you're injecting current right, right away as you get the voltage tip. Uh, and then, so this is the kind of a captured voltage response uh, for the grid forming mode. So, um, and same thing now uh, to to motivate, uh, to basically in UK right now, the market got the inertia, uh, the, so UK created the inertia market 
for grid farming. They also created a system strength market uh, or system uh, short circuit current market, so as to say, and then they're procuring generation under that. Uh, so there's a lot of project that got triggered. Uh, it's called Pathfinder, uh, Stability Pathfinder, uh, an initiative right now. And then there are a lot of project being studied uh, for inertia, inertial support in, in UK market right now. So, so just uh, I think I think for the for the for the uh, regulators and the in the audience, like we the the motivation has been driven through the market in Australia and UK, um, <clears throat> and then um, I think uh, we are talking about other applications now. Just there was an example on grid farming, but BES has been applied for many other applications like natural gas speaker replacement. And, and as we all know, like BES can respond very fast. So it, it far exceeds the ramp capabilities of a peaker plant, uh, can come online pretty quickly. And that's been uh, uh, like a lot, lot of projects are driven from that fact um, in California. So another one is like Western Australia, where Western Australia is a separate grid from East Australia, like pretty small grid, I think two gigawatt or something like that. Um, and then they, they have a lot of issue because of the duck curve where uh, they literally have very less generation remaining on the grid to keep it stable in the daytime. And now it's like a 250 megawatt project that we're building uh, right now for, for Western Australia. And the, and the goal there is to not, not just provide the energy, but also stability uh, during the, the low generation time um, <clears throat> to the grid. So um, this is another about the transmission deferral. Uh, this is something I know, like we we think it's a, a textbook thing, but it's truly not. Like uh, there's a lot of, I think there's a Germany, there's a project, uh, the, the Germany actually has a market for it now uh, or have projects on, on the same line. We did one for transmission uh, deferral called VBB, 300 megawatt project. Uh, and the idea is pretty simple. Like you have two lines connecting two different regions and then the lines cannot be overloaded for uh, as if you lose one line and the BES is kind of providing you that short time uh, power capacity so that you kind of, you know, it absorbs all the overload from one line so that in the steady state, you can run both the line at a higher megawatt rating. Uh, and not just that, they, uh, they just, uh, they are not using just it for higher line transfer. The battery can also participate in the energy market. And, if there is a system strength rule, then we can, like, let's say Australia creates a system strength rule and they can pay the batteries to provide that system strength, then you can also get uh, paid through that process. Point being, I think uh, one of the gap in the industry today in, in North America specifically is megawatts and reliability are talked separately. Uh, and, and I know someone asked the question in the last panel, what is reliability? And reliability from the grid perspective is, can you hold the frequency and the voltage, right? So battery is good at providing megawatt, but at the same time, battery is very good at holding the frequency and voltage. And that's that's added benefit for not just the node you are connecting, but also all the renewables nearby. So, um, so I think, yeah. So I think that that's that's a that's a uh, uh, that's a kind of a thinking that has to like really set in. How do we club all these benefits because then you might create a lot of value, uh, you know, depending on how you do the project. Um, so another one is the distribution deferral. Like, uh, again, it's not, not a thought experiment. This has been done. Like there's a, a airport in, in California, a small airport uh, connected with a single uh, distribution line on pg and &E system. Had a lot of wildfire issues. So they put a battery um, and then basically now battery backs up the load in a grid farming mode. Uh, when you lose the line, so you all, always are feeding critical load. Uh, is this is a this is a very critical one. I feel it's a pretty big game changer, and people should think about this as a case study going forward. Is a KES project in Hawaii, 185 megawatt battery. Uh, it's doing its energy, it's doing stability, it's doing black star, all three. Uh, it's 15 percent of the island load. Um, it's operational right now. It, it went into operation last year, uh, end of last year. Um, so doing all three services was very extensively studied by HECO in PSCAD model. And then um, so like, uh, and then, then we did the first black start, just the plant black starting. Imagine like thousands of inverters starting at the same time, building the voltage and closing back to the grid. Uh, I cannot show that plot here, but it was pretty fun plot to see. Uh, and a pretty clean voltage 
uh, build up you know so i i feel like uh like the talks of grid forming holding the grid like are not again theoretical exercise it's it's happening in hawaii right now um <clears throat> So I think, uh, and then hybrid dispatcher, again, I think there's a lot of uh, pairing of battery with the solar. Uh, so uh, we're, doing, we're doing a lot of those type, type of projects too right now. So, so I think I just want to like show this very simple slide. I know everyone is probably aware of this already, but I want to like highlight two things here uh, is uh, there is a fundamental distinction of how an inverter-based plant looks differently than from a synchronous machine plant used to look, right? And then in the core distinction is like, you are fundamentally adding all these distributed small inverter on a site through a software, you are binding them through the software and producing a response at the POI. So there is a big, a software is a big part of uh, this plant level aggregation. And I know it makes people uncomfortable sometimes when you when you do this for the first time and you say, hey, I'm just changing my software to increase the MVA or do do other things. But point being, this is pretty this is at the heart of the plant design to begin with, which also means if you add or subtract one inverter from the plant and keep this and and, and your software can maintain the MVA or maybe 30% inverter of the plant for augmentation and other things, then it should not give us a hard one because that's the fundamental architecture of all these inverter-based designs. A software is a thing that binds them, so that it can it can control them, uh, which also means you have to think about things like communication delays, um, uh, and that's where like uh, the the grid following. We'll talk about it. Like was this was what what was the heart of you know the, where the insta instability comes from. So you have to think about delays and uh, and meet and meter and meter responses and things like that. Point being, I would say there are two underlying principles: aggregation and some delays uh, that you have to deal with. But if you can bind it through the software, you can produce whatever you want, literally. And I, I'm starting to, uh, like when I joined Tesla from AEP, I used to be at American Electric Power. I, I like It took me some time to like really digest that. But yeah, I'm truly believe about that. Uh, um, and then like on the control stack, like we all talk about grid following and forming, and there could be things in between, um, uh, which people might give different name. But at the end, at, at the end it's more like, one is a delay weight system, one is an instantaneous response system. So uh, we'll get in the heart of it. Uh, and again, all these technologies are new. So there has to be a lot of convincing that needs to happen if you are doing a project for the first time, say in a utility or an ISO, uh, which is fair, right? Uh, but so, and for that, it's very important as an OEM that uh, your models are truly reflecting your plan. Um, and that's one thing I always say, like plant, like models are your window to the plant. So, so make sure like as an OEM to build this confidence that your models are absolutely sp spot on of what you're doing in the plant and do whatever you have to do to make it make it happen. And then we, we do it across the board, like from hill testing to model and model to model benchmarking and model to site benchmarking, uh, which which naturally happens for us because we are in Australia. We do a lot of projects in Australia, which is very strict about model to site benchmarking and can block the commissioning if you're not benchmarking in, in the moment of commissioning. So, <clears throat> um. So I think just first principle, what, what is grid forming? Again, uh, it's very, very simple. You're trying to provide a synchronous machine-like response instantaneously, like, tru like truly sub-cycle response. Um, and then uh, the only limitation is there is a current limit in the inverter, uh, which is something I feel as an industry, we should really get down to like doing a lot of grid forming, 100% studies uh, on the grid as a thought experiment and see what is that current limit need to be. But uh, I think that that's a fundamental question to be asked, uh, like like really distilled down. We we have our own theories, and then we are kind of. Uh, I think it's good to see some industry reports on that. So, uh, I think like and what is what is grid forming fundamental? Like basically, what do we need the grid? What what controls do we need for the grid to be called grid? Right. So any anything that is uh, any generation which is kind of the node nodes that are holding the grid need to stabilize the frequency, that's first principle, uh, which means you need to provide some inertial response. And how much inertial response do you need to provide depends on how much gap you need to fill before your PFR kicks in, uh, which obviously is system dependent. And as, as grid is evolving, you might need different amount of inertia. Um, and then you need to stabilize the voltage because 
if you plug your charger or something in the in the socket, like you need a voltage and a frequency. That's all you need, right? So you need to provide, stabilize the volt, voltage and the frequency instantaneously. And then uh, you, you should be able to hold the islanded section of the grid because grids do sectionalize because there are uh, weather events. Uh, and they're not all the grids which are connected by 10 lines. There are grid sections which are connected maybe by just one line or two lines. So you need to hold the island. And then in black start, right? So if the if you if you do go blackout, which which because you cannot certain hundred percent success, you know, with the grid always working, so you need to be able to do black start. So that's that's a really fundamental defining characteristic of grid forming in, in our mind. Um, and then I think the the core part is again instantaneous response versus delay based response, which is which is where a lot of the grid following issue came from. So if there's a delay in the control, there will be instability. This one's principal. And I think uh, showing that here, like uh, for a frequency response, uh, you need to fill the inertial uh, part. I think we talked about that. I think so not much to say here. Uh, as the penetration will increase, the inertia will go down and then it will create an instability issues uh, depending upon how slow the PFR of the rest of the remaining system is in that moment. And then you need to fill up that gap through inertial response. And, and that's that's the fundamental need of the inertia. Um, uh, same for voltage, you know, you, you have seen like plots from uh, studies where the voltage uh, from grid following has this shape, you know, which sags. And when you come back out of the fault, it, it overshoots this. It's all because of delay, because you're catching up. Uh, grid forming doesn't, uh, has that issue. Um, and then last man standing scenario, like if you lose the grid, you should be able to like survive and, and black start the system. And then this is an example from our health, health setup. So we just to show you, even with grid following, even if you have group and voltage control and match the load with the commanded power, uh, your system will collapse, uh, which is the plot on the left versus the grid forming, which barely sees the difference, right? Uh, a more critical slide because for, for the thought for the group, and I know this has been talked in different sessions, we need, we need to like have a market for reliability, inertia and system strength, to motivate because otherwise in today's world, developer will always do megawatt because that's what they get paid for. Utility will do reliability projects. They cannot do the megawatt, so they will do synchronous condenser. So where does the battery lie? But if you if you have markets that can do megawatt system strength and inertia all, then you, you will see these projects coming online pretty quickly. Also with the 2100 coming, we have to make sure there is nothing in the minimum requirements, right? Like a 40 millisecond uh, uh, you know, reactive time, that blocks the grid forming. And last but not the least, which I feel is the holy, holy grail of this whole, whole like kind of de de uh, deciphering the 14 commandment of synchronous machine that no one gave us, is back calculate how much inertia, like overload and current overload do you need uh, for these systems to be really doing their job for next 30 years. So I think that's it, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Prashant. That was a really nice characterization and overview to, to kick us off today. And, um, you know, I'd like to pull a little bit more on some of the things that you said, you know, as we're getting into the, the Q&A later on. But the one aspect that I'd like to talk about next is the inertia capability. And uh, we have Sam Malecki here from Electric Power Engineers. He's a senior principal power systems engineer at EPE and is here to talk with us now uh, about inertia and what goes beyond inertia when it comes to the capabilities and needs of our future grid. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sam. Yeah, I think I got it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to start with uh, saying thank you to Isek and uh, Julio for your kind invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, this presentation that I'm going to uh, go through today it's a lot of math involved and a small signal stability controller. They are just boring as stuff for many. So even sometimes I try to talk to my wife about these stability issues and she just gets tired and like, so I'm trying to find out something that is more common 
for it's a more common sense and it's although i'm talking about like a lead lag controller and everything believe me or not it all goes back to the revenue at the end of the day system reliability i see plants are getting curtailed utility love to or system operator love to curtail you because you are not cooperating that well so although you see a lot of controllers and everything at the end of the day the key takeaway that i would say is going to be the revenue, more revenue, less capex at the beginning, more reliability on the system and everything around that. And it's a li little bit futuristic approach. It's not maybe today, we, we need it today, but it's a little bit for a uh, little later on in, in our development and, and our transition to 100% renewable. So far, what we know and we get used to is generation, transmission, and load. Everyone knows all these three elements, and we know how to deal with that because we've been working with synchronous generator, typical load, and the transmission for several years. What is happening here? And actually, I try to put cool pictures here just to make it a little bit more fun. So we have a generation. We have the load. We need every, everything from a generation unit. And the load is just relaxed. Load just wants the power. Load do not do anything rather than just demanding. But we have a really good train generation unit. Let me go back to one of the main or the fundamental system model that we know from Dr. Kundur's book, the two area system. Four generation unit, constant power load or constant current load at the beginning, at, in the middle. And it's the fundamental, like I would say, it, it shaped my fundamental understanding of the stability. But it's, but it's changing because the loads behavior are changing. The generation behavior also is changing. So if you look at the previous slide, for every almost generator that bigger than certain limit, depending on the region, we have a power system stabilizer. Power system stabilizer, by definition, is stabilizing the power system uh, to be, to, be a, to be a stable, in a stable manner. Now we are adding renewable energy resources, solar, wind, energy storage. Everything looks fancy, but there's no stabilizer. There's no power system stabilizer on any of these devices. There was a talk yesterday that why it's not there, why we don't ask for more from these guys, because there's no incentive. No one pays for that. And someone was saying that, oh, it's just a control, it should be free. No, it's not free. You need to pay for it. But at the same time, someone needs to develop it. So if the, there's a demand, I'm sure that the technology is there. It's just a matter of whether, what's the benefit for me? Everyone is looking for some benefit, right? Nothing is free. Now we have so many generation units and the load of sale is just relaxed. But we have many more generation units rather than all huge Power plant, now we have solar, wind, and everything. Now they need to dance with each other. They need to know how to dance and make the system stable. For that, we come up with the very sophisticated solution, fax and synchronous condenser. Oh, they can provide short circuit. They can provide a stability. Oh, they are beautiful. They are expensive. And there's huge lead time for any of these devices. Although they can provide a great support, but can you wait for one year to get your staff come there and provide the stability? Well, that's the question. Now we are going to the new era of the grid forming. Uh, we have many grid forming plants and they are operating, it's going to be more. And we, need, we know that we need them more because they provide inertia, we, they provide damping and everything. So here, from this point moving forward, there are main two control technology for grid forming. There are many other more, but there are two main things. Virtual synchronous machine and droop control base. Virtual synchronous machine mode of operation is basically what we expect from the grid forming. We are saying, okay, we are taking out the generator. Now you need to behave like a generator. Like we love to see those oscillations. They go up and down and damp. This is what we used to know, and we feel more comfortable towards this. But droop, it's simple. It's just a K gain, just go up, go down. It's not fancy. But this study shows that it actually works, 
or may works even better. So we developed the grid forming in a small signal and EMT model. And basically we started from the two area machine, two area, two area uh, power system from Kondorzberg. What we did, we did a lot of tests, putting the grid forming, replacing the generator with grid forming uh, everywhere here and there to see what's the effect actually. So now we get to the boring part, the small signal stability. We run the small signal stability, stability with the grid forming, <clears throat> with the synchronous generator and the grid form. If we go with the virtual synchronous machine, we could get exactly the same small signal and a small signal results, <clears throat> which means virtual synchronous machine can provide the exact same behavior up and down of the power. Now we are getting to the interesting part. Everyone is talking about losing the inertia, <clears throat> which is the great fact. Reducing the inertia, you see that, oh, it's just jumping up and down so fast. Everything become more stable, more unstable. If you if you notice a, a small signal analysis, that that black thing is just going up and becomes the red critical and stable. Everything is so bad by reducing inertia. So I reduce inertia, 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 and then just reduce it till the time that it's almost no inertia. Once it becomes almost no inertia in the system, the system becomes highly stable. There's no mode of oscillation. There are some very high frequency which damps very fast. I'm not talking about those, but there is absolutely no low frequency oscillation remaining in the system. Everything just damps up pretty quick. And then we did another test. We said, oh, what is this exactly? It was new to me. Now let's make it, let's now make the inertia of the existing machine to be infinite, like 10,000 seconds or something like that. We get the exact same results. So either you don't have inertia or you have infinite inertia, the results is beyond inertia capability. Everything is super stable. Look at the results here. As you see, I started from no grid forming in the system. So that's the pretty much a standard one. I go to 50%, the system becomes a little bit less stable. 70%, oh, it's getting really bad. And I just continue it. And at 100%, you see that there's no oscillation, it just damps. And I have no inertia. So now the question is that, do I really need to have a virtual synchronous machine? Well, we can discuss that. Now the problem, here we are talking about the load as well. How much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. So now let's look at the load side. As I was saying, load was just relaxed at all time because there's an issue, just give me power. You need to be stable, Every, everything should be fine. But because the, short, because the short circuit level of the system goes down, everyone goes to the panic mode. Now we are talking about the different type of loads, hydrogen facilities, uh, data center, and they have a different dynamics. They need short circuit. We did another study to prove that this is the case. So going back to the sync, like a two area machine system, synchronous generator, no GFM at all. What we did in this study as shaped or fundamental, the loads are constant power, constant current load. We have started changing the load to the composite load model with more dynamic. What you see here, if the load is pretty much constant power load, everything's fine. I see many islanded studies for hydrogen facilities, for example, they use constant power load. They don't use com composite load model, but it's, it's, <clears throat> it cannot go that way. So if I increase it to 10%, I see some oscillation is happening and it's just load is changing. Now 20%, oh, more oscillation. 50%, the system is not stable anymore. So what I'm saying is that now, it's more of how load is behaving. We need to really think about like the load behavior. To get to that beyond inertia feature, I wanna have a constant load. I don't want the load to do anything bad. So if you're talking about like hydrogen facilities or data center, what is their fundamental? 90%, around 90% is inverter based. What we expect from those loads, Oh, we just demand your power. Maybe fix the voltage. That's the max we, need, we ask for them. But actually they can do much more. They can behave as a huge fax devices. If you're talking about like thousand megawatt of load, 
which is the high, which is the inverter base device, you can do much more. You can put a power oscillation damping on top of the reactive power controller and basically damp the oscillation. And as you see here, it's exactly the same case. We test a different mode of operation for the load, voltage control or Q control mode. And on top of that, we, use, we go over the voltage control mode and put the lead lag controller and basically power oscillation damping. You see that this, the, the oscillations are damped by the load itself. But our fundamental of power, power system stability, everything goes back to the generator. Now we can ask more from the load side. <clears throat> and here's the final results. If I can put the power oscillation damping on the load, new type of load, like hydrogen facility, data center, and just tell them, oh, you damp, you, you make sure that you're, you don't provide, you don't introduce any more mode to the system. And then my grid forming to be in the droop control mode. You see that black, uh, black line? System is super stable. Not much of oscillation. I don't have the low frequency oscillation anymore. And here I didn't use any facts or stats from devices. And this is a key for, especially maybe not now in, in, in the large network, but if you are talking about the islanded facilities for the, <clears throat> to provide a hydrogen load for thousands of megawatt. Actually, I did that a study for the two gigawatt of the system, island. So these technology can result in millions or billions of dollars. The initial study come up with like, oh, you need 10 synchronous condenser unit of each 500 MVA to basically have a stable system. But if you do really go to that controller, do the good tuning and everything, you don't need a synchronous condenser. You just need a good grid forming, good behavior from the load, significant cost difference. I'm talking about the billions of dollars here. It's not, <clears throat> it's, it, yeah, it's not going to be uh, uh, that uh, not like useless. It's it's really in needed, and I think we sh we should think about it now. Anyway, some more, in, more interesting findings, just go a little bit into more detail. What about during the transition period? Now we are talking about, okay, if it's 100% grid forming, yeah, that makes sense. But what if we are like, we are transitioned through that 100%, let's say. Well, or a study shows that if you put the grid formings in kind of a balanced approach and you use virtual synchronous machine or, or the droop control mode, it doesn't change the behavior of the system that much. So you, you can define the area of, uh, of, the, of the modes, let's say east, west, or something like that, and then balance those <clears throat> uh, placement of the grid forming. Now, on the other hand, if you do not do it in the balanced mode, it will drastically change the behavior of the system. So let's say I go and just, Say, uh, the east side, I just put grid forming. On the west side, I don't put any grid forming. Then you are significantly changing the mode of the system. So you need to think of a system as a whole and just make sure that you keep the balancing of the grid forming because these two <clears throat> can significantly change the behavior of the system. In terms of the frequency, well, someone may ask what is the frequency behavior? Actually, we put the grid forming on the right side and the uh, synchronous generator on the other side, and we apply the fault, we break it. So we disconnected two basically grids together. You see that the one that has the grid forming, the frequency doesn't change that much. It's super stable. Well, the, the protection is off here, but anyway. But if you see, if, uh, if you just let it go, you see that the frequency of that synchronous generator part populated, it just takes some time to get uh, initialize. I mean, get stable. And uh, with that said, for the conclusion, I would say there are different modes for grid forming. Uh, we we show that like if you are you have a lot of grid forming, uh, like around ninety percent, eighty percent grid forming, and you have a system like that in the future, you can go for the droop control. The droop control doesn't doesn't introduce any mode of oscillation, your system is super stable. 
we need to shift our perspective from purely on the generation part for the stability to the load side. Loads can do a lot here. If you are talking about a hydrogen facilities or data center, ask more. There should be incentives for those. There should be a courage for these developers to basically provide these type of services. And at, at the end, you may not need to put invest so much money on the fax or statcom devices. They are good, but the same functionality can be provided by the generation grid forming and the load side. And that's pretty much it for me. And uh, thank you again. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. That was a really great walkthrough. Um, I'd like to continue our discussion now and turn it over to Sean Dong, who's going to talk about uh, the ability to stabilize high IBR power systems with grid forming technology and, and what that means, right? How not only do you build grid forming capability, but how do you actually deploy it to solve the real grid need? So I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Sean now and Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully it works now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean from uh, Unreal, and uh, my research interest is basically a few keywords, uh, EMT simulation, grid forming in water, oscillation event analysis. So today I would uh, use some uh, real world example to highlight some performance uh, of grid forming in water. So first, as we know, our conventional power system, as the figure on the left-hand side shows, is a sequence generator dominated. Uh, but uh, for now, we have more and more power, system, uh, power electronic devices in our system, and the red sh shade highlights on the right. So we have uh, utility level PV, wind, we have HVDC, we have DER, we have EV charger. So what's the impact for our power system is that we have reduced the inertia and we also have new stability issues caused by these inverters. And as we could see from this figure, flow chart actually from IEEE, it will extend the class as a category of stability by adding this converter driven instability. And also we have a few examples like uh, in Xinjiang, in AMO, in Urquhart, we have different uh, oscillation events caused by these uh, newly added inverters. And now we see some, uh, let's see, focus on one event in Hawaii. And uh, this is a, a snapshot uh, before one oscillation event in Kauai Island. Kauai Island is the fourth largest uh, island in Hawaii. And its total load at that time is about uh, 40 megawatts. So here we, uh, uh, on the right hand side, it's the map of Kauai Island. We highlight uh, actually uh, five major plants here. So there is a uh, plant A, which is a conventional synchronous generator, which is supplied in 60% of the total load. We have uh, four major IBR, IBR one, two, three, four here. So one, two, three is adopting grid following in water and uh, IBR4 is the water synchronous machine. So one kind of the grid forming in water. And now let's see what happens. So this uh, happened on November 21st, 19, uh, 2021. So what we can see is at the beginning it's uh, fine. So the each plant is represented by one circular shape. The size it represent its output. So at the beginning we see plant A has the largest size, which means the plant A is uh, supplying the grid. And then plant A is tripped. Actually, that uh, circular shape disappear. And we see that the remaining IBR, they are increasing their size, their output, but they are oscillating. So we also plot the frequency at a different place with this color. Red means it's below 60 Hertz. We see oscillation in the frequency in different active power uh, from IBR. And then our next question is, who is a troublemaker in this uh, oscillation event. So first, uh, uh, we do some data-based analysis. So besides uh, enjoying the pleasure of collecting data, we use the data to do some analysis. So actually, we use two uh, measurement-based analysis to locate the source of the oscillation. So on the left-hand side, 
we use a method called the dissipating energy flow, uh, which is uh, from Tsinghua University. And uh, we plot the energy for each IBR. So if the energy is increasing, it means this IBR is injecting uh, energy corresponding to this oscillation frequency. So this is a troublemaker. So we can clearly see from this uh, figure that uh, this uh, uh, this IBR4, which is adopting grid forming in water, is not injecting power. So it's not the source of the uh, uh, oscillation. It's not a troublemaker. But the two IBR, uh, two grid following in water, IBR1 and IBR2, they are injecting energy. They are the source of the oscillation. Uh, for cross validation purpose, we use a different method also from Tsinghua University. We get the same conclusion. So now we put our focus to these two grid following inverter. So first we developed a system host EMT model to replace the event, but to, to clearly understand the root cause of this event, actually we uh, we also recreated the event with a small infinite burst system with the well-tuned generic grid following model. So we tuned the model based on the practical setting, based on our knowledge of uh, these plants. So here, the first one is a base case. So we add a delay, we set up the short circuit ratio, we set up the, uh, the change similar to that MLS1. What we see is we see some oscillation around the 20 hertz. This is our base case. And then we try to play with different uh, parameters in this infinite bar system. And uh, after some uh, trial and error efforts, we find that uh, by playing with the two, four key parameters, we are able to change the results and stabilize the system. See as, uh, for example, the frequency measurement delay, I think Sam also highlights the uh, uh, importance of this delay. And uh, there are the PF droop constant, there are the uh, PL uh, gain, and also the green strength. So now we can answer one question. So what is the root cause of this oscillation event? So one sentence root cause. So we can see that uh, this is, the root cause is the grid following in water with large frequency measurement delay and a non-optimal parameterization on operating weak grid condition. That is the root cause in time domain. And uh, we can also do some similar study in frequency domain. For example, so uh, again, we'll perturb different uh, parameters and uh, get uh, generate some more Nyquist curves. So we know, uh, we know, we know that uh, in circling critical point minus one zero or not determine the stability. And uh, we can uh, make this process more clear by showing this uh, animation. So we can clearly see that uh, we change the parameter of the frequency measurement delay. So at the beginning, the Nyquist curve is this green one, not in circling the critical point. But uh, if we increase the delay, we see we get a uh, larger red uh, necklace curve in circling critical point become unstable. And uh, now we put the root cause that we identified on the left-hand side. So first, uh, uh, grid forming water, this design itself is one root cause. We place the four parameters here. And uh, then we uh, design mitigation method based on our study. So first, uh, for example, we can do some parameter tuning uh, we highlighted the the change we made for the uh, for for any item in the list with the yellow color. So we know that this PF droop constant is one issue. So we play with this PF droop constant. We change it from three percent to four percent. We get the blue trees, no oscillation, and uh, we also play with the PL again. We reduce it uh, from uh, uh, zero point one five to zero point one. Again, we get this blue trees. We still keep the grid following in water. And also we highlight that this uh, simulation is from the whole system EMT model, not the infinite bar system. And then, so one, one cause is uh, uh, the weaker grid, as a lower grid strength, a small short circuit ratio. So we know that one method is that we can add, we can simply add uh, synchronous generators. And uh, in Kawaii system, there are different uh, diesel generator, a small diesel generator, we call it a SG1, SG2, SG3, each rated eight megawatt. So what we did is a sequence generator, we can indeed call it a grid forming resources, right? So we add a sequence generator one by one in case two, two to case five. Case one is the best case with the oscillation. So with, what we can see that is uh, we add one generator, 
and uh, the green color means the generator is on. So it's still unstable, we see the oscillation. We add two generator, we still see the oscillation, so the magnitude is smaller. We add three, okay, the system is uh, actually stable. We see minimum oscillation magnitude. So the message is that we need to turn on 24 megawatts of synchronous generator, actually they are diesel generator to make the system stable. And uh, this is uh, actually not economical. And uh, can you see the uh, utility of Kauai Island really do this? And uh, the next, uh, our final solution, we go back to the topic, go back to the grid forming uh, inverter topic. So what we did is we have uh, other case. So for example, in case uh, six, so recall that the original uh, generation mix of the system is a three grid following inverter, one VSM. So what we did in case uh, six is we uh, find, uh, we convert one uh, grid following inverter to the droop based uh, grid forming inverter. In case seven, we convert one uh, grid following inverter to VSM. And in case eight and case nine, so we convert both to either droop or uh, VSM. And uh, this is, um, mitigation method for our uh, root cause list. Actually, we, 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 we address two among, the, among them. So the key message is that we, by converting any single grid forming inverter to grid forming one, we get a stable result. And the recall that uh, if we connect a synchronous generator, we need to connect a 24 megawatts. And here, even the smaller one, if we convert a six megawatt grid following inverter to grid forming one, we can address the issue. Oh, thank you. And uh, finally, we uh, another case, we can have some observation between the difference between droop and the VSM. We know that the VSM, as the person mentioned, it provides virtual inertia. So we can see from this uh, rule of compar comparison here, using VSM generate a small rule curve. And finally, these are all simulation. We know that all models are wrong. Some of them are useful. So there is uh, one field of data, field validation here. So since that event, uh, since uh, August 2024, uh, 2022, can you see actually convert one grid forming inverter? The IBR1, actually the cases for 6A in our study into grid forming one. And uh, later on August 2nd, 2023, so they experienced very similar event with uh, similar I minus contingency. We get the red trace without any oscillation. In comparison, the blue trace with the previous simulation. So in the field validation, it addressed the oscillation event. And finally, we can use a figure, actually you, you use some analysis to highlight what is really happening in the field. So the, on the left-hand side, so we, we, we plot the short circuit ratio at a different IBR. So the red trace is the previous trace. So we get a smaller number. After converting one grid following inverter to grid forming one, we get the green bar at a different uh, bars, so we see that the green bar is higher than the red one, which means we get a higher short circuit ratio. And uh, if we check the stability region with the x-axis as the short circuit ratio, so why is the oscillation event happened? The operating point is this B in this red, red unstable region. After that conversion to grid forming inverter, we move the uh, operating point to A within the stable region. And this is another uh, study. So based on the st some statistics uh, analysis, we also see the frequency deviation after that conversion is uh, more closer to uh, more 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 secret uh, more um, um, is more within this uh, positive minus zero point zero one hertz. And uh, finally, uh, I can quickly plot this uh, video like uh, with the grid forming inverter. So this is the uh, animation after we adopt that uh, uh, grid, second grid forming inverter and a very similar uh, very similar MS1 continuous thing happen again. We see that uh, we see uh, the frequency decline, but there is no significant oscillation. So this highlights uh, uh, the benefit of the grid forming inverter in stabilizing the system. Uh, finally, some uh, key message. So we have uh, more IBRs in our system and uh, adding, uh, adopting grid forming inverter could uh, strengthen the grid to address the potential oscillation risks. 
and it also can improve the frequency dynamics. But the beware that it uh, might not be the uh, silver bullet, we might uh, be exposed to uh, uh, new stability challenges. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Sean. That was a really nice overview of some practical deployment of grid forming and showing the value that grid forming can bring and stabilization. Uh, to round out the presentation part of our panel, I'd like to now turn it over to Shahil Shah at NREL. And I uh, really want to say thanks to Shahil for leading our reliability working group efforts around grid forming capabilities and testing of those capabilities. And Shahil's going to talk more about that in detail here. Um, so please welcome Shahil Shah, and then we'll, uh, we'll round out with a, a set of questions and Q&A at the end. Thank you. Shahil, please take it away. Thank you, Jason. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about grid farming, inverter hardware testing. And I think this is a fairly broad topic because there are many things like uh, when a customer buys a grid farming technology, uh, it, there is no way to know how grid farming it is, how better or a bad grid forming technology it is by just looking at the steady state behavior. You have to wait till any stability event in your grid to really understand if that grid forming device is really helping to stabilize the grid or not. So that is why the testing is very important. And then there are many, the other reason testing is important is because uh, the specifications, there's a lot of talk about how do we specify the grid forming technology? What should be its data sheet or specifications? And that ties to how do we test it? Because if we put a specification uh, like inertia uh, support or voltage source behavior, we need to have specifications to test it against. And the third part is really about uh, where do we test it? Should we test it in using EMT models uh, from vendors? Should we test it in laboratory? Uh, should we test it in field uh, in a, uh, when it is after it is commissioned? Or we do some power hardware in the loop? So testing covers a lot of aspects. And uh, that's why I have like more slides than probably I should for 20 minutes, but Jason was kind enough to give me five extra minutes. So, but I'll try to rush through and touch upon all those aspects. So here is the outline. Uh, first is I'm going to talk about the hardware testing platform that we have at Enrel, uh, recent grid forming testing projects at Enrel, which goes beyond battery, looking at grid forming for PV and uh, wind technologies. The third aspect is quantifying system needs for grid forming resources. Uh, what do we need from the system? Because then only we can specify the grid forming technology and some of the advanced testing of grid forming uh, resources, which goes beyond uh, testing that we do for you general IPRs like fault right through or low voltage right through behavior. Those are, those are standard testing, but something which we do beyond those standard testing for grid following, that is what I'm going to talk about in, in my slides. So first, mega, mega out scale hardware uh, testing platform at Enrel. Uh, this is a very nice slide prepared or diagram prepared by my colleague Wahan, where you see the uh, different mega out scale technologies we have at Flatirons campus, starting from uh, 2.5 mega out and 5 mega out dynamometer for testing wind turbine nacelles, a uh, 600 kilograms hydro storage facility with one mega out electrolyzer and 1.25 mega out uh, fuel cell inverter. A uh, few PV systems, a uh, few pads where we have basically we can bring in inverter from a from an OEM to test it under different circumstances. Uh, battery energy storage systems and real PV plant and PV areas and wind turbines and the main centerpieces uh, for this testing bed is really the two grid simulators that you see uh, in this blue color. One is seven mega grid simulator, and another is twenty mega grid simulator. In addition to all this hardware, uh, we have a very advanced medium voltage data acquisition system. So we can capture high resolution 50 kilohertz waveform uh, during our uh, test results. So this is the same, like if you see the diagram and picture looks similar, like the topology, all these assets that we have at, at our campus. And uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but uh, you can refer all the labels once uh, the slides are uploaded. Uh, we also have a synchronous generator, a 2.5 MA synchronous generator, because we want to test all these IBRs, uh, as uh, Prashant mentioned, like a test last man standing when there is no synchronous generators, how these IBRs are going to operate. So we have a synchronous machine 
as a part of the mix where we can do similar testing. And uh, I'll skip the slides. Uh, basically, they are just specifications of our grid simulator. Seven megawatt grid simulator, which was commissioned in 2013, and then uh, uh, 20 megawatt grid simulator, which was commissioned just a uh, couple months back. It This grid simulator, in addition to supplying uh, AC voltage, it is also capable of supplying 5 kV DC for testing uh, high power chargers and MVDC grid type of stuff. So moving on to recent grid forming testing project. Uh, one project that we recently concluded is uh, is with GE, where we tested the invert grid forming in PV inverters. Uh, two of those, as you can see in the picture on the left, that was supplied initially, initially or during the initial phase of testing by uh, two megawatt DC power supply. And uh, uh, recently we connected one of that inverter to actual real PV arrays. We did a bunch of testing, uh, phase jump, voltage jump, low voltage ride through, frequency scans, impedance scan, ability to operate with uh, weaker grids, and uh, we'll have a result shortly in, in, in form of report. Uh, the second project which is ongoing is uh, grid forming wind turbine, type three wind turbine, uh, again with G, where we are testing a 2.5 megawatt type three wind turbine technology in a grid forming mode, uh, and to understand difference between the grid following operation and grid forming operation. Again, we have a lot of uh, testing over there. One such testing is here where we expose this turbine to a low voltage event or low voltage ride through as you see on the top left. And then the middle one is uh, is the current from, from the turbine. Because when we put the grid forming mode in the turbine, we want to make sure that it doesn't lose its perform standard performance like a low voltage ride through or fault ride through. Uh, many of these projects, when we do this uh, type of uh, grid forming testing, we also have uh, another test, which is black start and islanded operation. So here, what you see is wind only microgrid test for this uh, grid forming type three wind turbine. So during the initial part of the test, the our grid simulator is making the grid, and then on the right, we on the top right, we have one point five megawatt real wind turbine. Uh, in a classical control or grid following mode, like a legacy product. Then the another one is a 2.5 megawatt type three grid forming wind turbine, and then the load bank. We open the breaker or basically disconnect the grid simulator and let the two wind turbines, one grid following and one grid forming, form an island and supply the load. Again, to test the grid forming capability of wind turbine. So this is, what happens like the GFL, GFM, and the load bank, they, they form an island. And uh, uh, because one of the wind turbine is like a real wind turbine, it is, uh, both are real wind turbines, I shouldn't say one is real. Like the only difference is that one real wind turbine is sitting in the field. So it is seeing the real wind conditions, whereas the grid forming turbine is sitting inside a dynamometer. So it is driven by, by a motor. And uh, we let it operate this microgrid for a few hours just to see if we can have a wind only islanded uh, microgrid. And uh, on the top left, you see uh, the loads are changing. The blue horizontal lines are basically, when the loads are changing, loads are switched. The a gray line is basically uh, the droop characteristic of, of a grid forming wind turbine. So what it shows is that as the frequency, uh, frequency goes high, the grid forming wind turbine reduces its output. The grid following wind turbine is uh, configured with a reverse group for stability. And then uh, on the right, you see this hour long, uh, of few hours long response where the microgrid is operating stably. There is a certain uh, time duration when uh, the wind dies out. And that's why we have to, the frequency starts going down and we have to do curtailment or basically remove, uh, shed certain loads. So that was about, uh, the testing infrastructure that we have at Enderl and then a uh, few recent projects on uh, grid forming PV and grid forming green. Of course, we do a lot of grid forming uh, battery testing, uh, testing best grid forming inverters. Uh, now, I'm going to move uh, into the second part of my presentation, which is really about how do we quantify grid forming behavior and the system needs. Uh, Shuan talked about this event that happened in KIUC, right? The oscillation events. And uh, we took the P vendor models of IBRs on the grid and tried to do the, uh, basically 
run impedance scans, have frequency domain analysis on those vendor black box models, so very high fidelity models. And uh, the conclusion of impedance-based study was that when that plant that you see by the as a red dot, when it tripped, uh, the grid strength for the entire grid came down. In terms of short circuit ratio, it came down. And that's why a few of those IBRs, which were operating in grid falling mode, they became unstable and they started oscillating. Uh, so grid strength was a real problem. All those IBRs in isolation just couldn't work with such a weak grid scenario. And here is one example where one of that grid following IBR, a battery energy storage system, is operating with not a real grid, but single machine infinite bus. Uh, this is an EMT model study. And as you can see, like when the short circuit ratio is high, the operation is stable, but for low short circuit ratio, this IBR starts oscillating. So it's really the short circuit ratio problem. And that is what we need from grid farming resources. We want grid farming resources to improve system strength and support stability of grid following IBRs or classical IBRs in its proximity or in the region. Now, system strength can mean many things, right? Whether it's a short circuit ratio, whether it's a voltage sensitivity, whether it's sensitivity of frequency to any active power changes. So how do we quantify the grid strength improvement that is brought along by a grid forming technology? Can we look at SCR improvement? Uh, my opinion, the answer is no, because grid forming as we define it is a dynamic fast time scale behavior. How that inverter is able to hold voltage and frequency stable in a fast time scale, not in steady state. In steady state, even grid following IBRs can do that. So SCR is not an uh, answer. The second reason is SCR is actually not a good indicator of grid strength. Although in the Hawaii case that I just presented, uh, SCR was able to predict the stability brown boundary for grid following IBRs. Tomorrow I'm going to do uh, talk about similar oscillation event and analysis uh, that we uh, analyze in Australia with uh, by collaborating with AMO, where they don't have any oscillation events or, or they have oscillation events in the absence of any event. So grid strength is not changing, no transmission line is stripping, no generator or conventional generator is stripping and still they are seeing oscillations. And we figured out that they don't have enough grid strength but not in terms of short circuit ratio in the more dynamic frequency range. So uh, that's why we have to move a little bit beyond SCR to understand grid strength. And uh, there are various ways we, we can test it. One is we can do the impedance scan at a broad frequency range to understand uh, at different nodes in power system, what is the impedance? If the impedance is low, that means the we have it is a stiff grid. Like any change in the current is not going to impact the voltage. The other approach is to look at voltage magnitude stiffness. So if there is a sudden reactive power loading in the grid, sudden increase in the loading, uh, is the voltage magnitude going to deviate too much from its nominal value or not? Now this can be done both in frequency domain, like we do a frequency scan or a transfer function from uh, reactive power to voltage magnitude, or we can do a field test where you suddenly increase the reactive power load in a uh, in the field and see what is happening with the voltage magnitude. We can do it without a grid forming technology in place and when that grid forming IBR is connected and just to see uh, how stabilizing the grid forming IBR is. And same with the uh, frequency or grid voltage phase. We can uh, do a frequency scan experiments or, or really basically time domain experiments where we apply step change in the, in the load. Now this test can be done in laboratory as well as well as in field. In field, of course, we can't do frequency scan or more comprehensive test, but we can always do uh, the transient test by uh, changing the load, active or reactive power loads. So a couple of tests that I want to talk about is, uh, one is the frequency scan test. And uh, I promise this is the only slide where I have equation on it. So uh, what you see is that I'm trying to quantify a voltage source behavior. And on the top, there's a voltage source behind a reactor. Again, this is what we want from a grid forming resource, right? And then on the bottom left is the time domain response of this voltage source when the grid voltage changes by 10%. And as you can see, it immediately dispatches a reactive power when the voltage, uh, the grid voltage at point of common coupling drops by 10%, this voltage source immediately dispatches reactive power to hold that voltage. 
And this is a fundamental characteristic of a voltage source. In the frequency domain, if I look at the transfer function from uh, voltage magnitude to reactive power output for this voltage source, it looks like a low pass filter with a constant gain in low frequencies. And the reason it's a constant gain is because for an X amount of change in the voltage, I want a proportional change in the reactive power output because I, I don't want my grid forming resource to dispatch crazily. That is only a 1% change in the, in the voltage magnitude. So the gain is constant. That is what I want. The second thing I want is that the phase of this transfer function is negative or 180 degrees because if the voltage goes down, I want the reactive power output of the grid forming IBR to go high. So it's an opposite phase relationship. And this is basically as basic as, as it gets. It's a voltage source behind a reactor. Now, based on that, we can come up with a criteria. We have a pass fill criteria where if this Q by V frequency scan of a resource, where what really we are doing again is that uh, we are modulating the voltage magnitude at the terminal of an IBR and seeing its reactive power response, uh, forming the full transfer function. And if that Q by V frequency scan of that grid forming device, if the magnitude and or gain is constant in four to 40 Hertz, which is basically the time scale where we look for grid forming behavior. And if the phase is closer to 180 degrees in that frequency range, that IBR is a grid forming resource. If it fails this criteria, then it's not a grid forming resource. So again, here we are talking of grid forming as a, as a functionality, as a behavior, and not as a type of a resource. So I don't really care about what, what are the controls implemented in, inside the IBI, whether it's a virtual synchronous machine, group control, or even current control. As long as it meets this test, uh, I'm good with it. So here are a few experiments. These are all uh, real experiments of uh, uh, various devices. Let me go through them uh, quickly. Uh, first, let's focus on the, on the right side. So, so what do we want from the grid? We want from grid that the trans voltage sensitivity index is, uh, is, is low or voltage sensitivity is low. Whenever there is any change in the reactive power loading of the system, we want the grid to maintain its voltage or we want V by Q to be small. What does it mean? We want from grid forming device, the Q by V to be high because it should stabilize that voltage. To reduce V by Q, we need to increase uh, Q by V, right? Just uh, turning the ratio. And this is how we can define the specifications of grid forming resources, starting from what the grid needs. And that is going to be different in different regions, different, depending on the topology, depending on the IBR concentration you have at the present stage or you expect in future. And this on the left are basically Q by V frequency scans of uh, different devices that we have tested at Endel. Again, all experimental results. Uh, the red one is 2.5 uh, megahertz synchronous condenser. It has a very flat line, as you can see in the magnitude and then in the phase also very close to 180 degrees. So our synchronous condenser is in a way acting as the best voltage source we have. Uh, the blue lines, uh, the solid blue line is basically a battery inverter, a 2.2 2 .2 megawatt battery inverter operating in grid forming mode. Again, it has a flat line. I, I don't know if you are able to see that. Uh, in the gain and also flat line in phase very close to 180 degrees. Now the same inverter, if we change its control mode to grid following, that becomes this dash blue line where it is nowhere, like it's it's not flat anymore in this Q by V frequency scan. The phase is no longer anywhere near to 180 degrees. So the same inverter when we just change the control mode, uh, the same hardware inverter, it's, it's not satisfying this criteria. We did this again with uh, a PV inverter uh, in a grid forming and grid following mode. Again, same behavior that when it's in the grid forming mode, the inverter is passing this test, though not as good as the battery inverter was doing. And this again depends on the control. So this is there is a way to define this uh, specifications for grid forming resources. Uh, the other advanced uh, test that I want to discuss is loss of last synchronous generator. So we have a a battery energy storage system with a 2.2 MVA SMA inverter, which can operate both in grid forming and grid following mode. Uh, it is connected to a synchronous condenser to form an islander grid and supplies to a load bank, a three megawatt, three MVA load bank. 
And then grid is something that we established by using our grid simulator. Uh, the test sequence is that we open uh, breaker one so that to make the island for the whole system. Now, what we really want to test is if the synchronous condenser is there in the system, how this system is going to operate when the inverter is in the grid following mode. And then what happens when we disconnect the synchronous condenser? Now repeat the same test sequence, but when the inverter is in a grid forming mode. So let's look around the left side. So here the inverter is in the grid following mode. And uh, what happens is when we apply step change in the load, we increase the load by 300 kilowatts uh, from around 400 kilowatts to 700 kilowatts. What happens is the synchronous condenser immediately supplies the additional power that is needed because, because of its inertia, it slows down the speed. And grid following inverter, because it's slow, it's not as fast as grid forming, it catches up and in steady state, it supplies all the power. Of course, synchronous condenser cannot supply steady state power. It goes back to its original pre-disturbance level, which is basically it is consuming a couple, few kilowatts for, to compensate for the losses. Now, when we trip the inverter, oh, sorry, when we trip the synchronous condenser, this system loses stability because there is no any grid forming device in the system. Synchronous condenser was holding the system stable. On the right is the same set of tests, but when the inverter is operating in grid forming mode, and as you can see from here, uh, the inverter also quickly dispatches active power, and then in steady state, it continues to operate after the synchronous condenser is lost. So this is again a test where we test several things. We test that whether the grid forming resource is able to hold system stable in steady state, basically small signal stability. We also test last signal stability. If there is a sudden change in the load flow condition, how, how the uh, IVR is acting. The last part of my uh, talk is about need of a reactor for testing grid forming devices. Now, certain grid forming devices will not work in an extremely strong grids. And we don't want them to work. If we basically design grid forming inverter to work with, let's say, short circuit ratio of infinite, then we might have a poor performance or weak grid conditions, and which is where we really want the grid forming device to operate, right? So because grid forming inverter is acting as a voltage source, connecting it to another voltage source might create stability issues. So what I'm trying to say is that a, for grid forming IBR, there might be a good range of uh, grid strength where it can work stably, and that range may not include extremely strong grid or ideal uh, voltage source. So now if it is not able to work with an ideal voltage source, which is we really don't want, right? We want to put grid forming devices where our grid strength is low. Then how do we test it? Because we can't directly connect a grid simulator to that inverter. It's just not able to work with an ideal voltage source like grid following inverters we uh, do. So we might need to insert a reactor between the inverter and grid simulator for testing. For example, here you see that the when the, the reactor size reduces, the inverter is becoming unstable. So we recently commissioned a brand new capability at Andal. Uh, we call it medium voltage impedance network. It is just a bunch of high power reactors and capacitors. It can do real emulation of weak grid conditions up to for short circuit ratio down to one and uh, for up to seven MVA devices. And it, it can also do emulation of uh, series compensation. Uh, we are working with uh, Florida Power and Light uh, to test some of the inverters that they are going to commission in, the, in their territory uh, using this capability so that uh, they have concerns about weak grid operation of some inverters. And we are going to test that capability for the grid forming inverters and also for grid forming inverters to make sure that the system will remain stable as they put more IBRs in, in the grid. Uh, well, this is my last slide, the, not the previous one. And that is about the value of power hardware in the loop testing. Uh, there is a lot of interest in power hardware in the loop. Uh, let me start with this one, where because the general idea is that we are testing real hardware with a real system model and it brings a lot of value. And that is true if done correctly. Uh, if the system model is, is small uh, compared to the hardware in, that you are testing, power hardware in the loop makes a lot of sense. But if your system is really big, the value of power hardware in loop goes down because now most of your system is actually in the model. And now that model, if it's not accurate, as accurate as vendor provided models, 
And if you use a very simplified model in PHIL experiments, then that testing might not be useful. And uh, the PHIL testing might have very low value if if we are talking about, let's say, testing uh, a grid forming IBR system for VEC, uh, and that IBR system is just uh, like few hundred megahertz, then the PHIL testing might not make sense, right? So in that case, we do open loop testing, same, same, some of the same tests that I talked about, validate the model, uh, the vendor models uh, uh, very comprehensively, and then use those models for uh, various type of stability studies. So to summarize uh, my presentation, improvement in grid strength is a core need or core requirement for grid forming resources. We have methods to translate that need into quantifiable specifications for grid forming resources, advanced tests for grid forming resources to check if it is the grid forming resources meet, is meeting their specifications or not. And we can come up with both laboratory and uh, field tests to demonstrate stabilizing, stabilizing impact of grid forming. So one key message that I want to make from this presentation is that I think there's a lot of uncertainty about can we test grid forming technology? Do we have specifications? Do we have methods? Uh, I would say we have them. It's just that they are not in the uh, uh, basically in a more accepted or or uh, standard forms. Uh, not in the IEEE standard, I would say, for example. But we are working, as uh, Jason mentioned, in a ESIC task force to come up with a document which provides all this guidance. Thank you.